Hey, everyone. Before we get to today's episode of Perpetual Chess, I just wanted to say thanks to everyone who has supported the show. Ways to support Perpetual Chess include telling a friend about the show, subscribing on Apple Podcasts or whatever platform you use, better yet, leaving a positive review on that platform. But most of all, I want to thank the people who've supported me with the new Patreon page. If you haven't heard, it's patreon.com slash perpetual chess. And the suggested donation there is $2 a month. So I tried to keep it as affordable as possible for as many people as possible. The donations go to cover things like the production, the audio equipment, and the hosting for the show. So if you can't afford it, you definitely shouldn't donate. But if you can, it's really appreciated and it helps out a lot. And guess what? I think it's also going to make the show better. What we're going to do is people who donate to the show will get advance notice of the guests and they will have the chance to send in questions to the guests. So if you feel like there's some topic I don't cover enough, or if you have some favorite player that you're waiting for them to come on, well, there's a good chance we're going to get them at some point. So now you can sit back and wait. And then when someone's coming on who interests you, you can pounce like a cheetah and get your questions in. I think this is going to make it a better show overall, more community driven. I've always said I want this show to be by the people and for the people. Well, I think that this will help make that happen. So thanks again for all the support and enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with the chess world's best players, promoters, and educators about their lives, careers, current projects, and best practices. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Perpetual Chess. I am here with eight-time Dutch champion, Grandmaster Luke Van Wheely. Thank you for joining us, Luke. A pleasure. So you're in the middle of a move. What's up? Why are you moving? Um, well, I've been living here for 23 years in a in an apartment, like 80 square meters. <laughs> and uh, well, the exit was kind of all right, especially when I was just uh, on my own. Then uh, I got um, I got a wife, so that was also still still convenient, still manageable, but. Um, now we have a little kid, and we definitely had to find something uh, bigger. And also, okay, we actually we hope uh, to to get a, a second uh, baby uh, in the near future. So we're looking uh, we, we look we're looking for some for some big improvement and bigger space. That's it. Nice. Well, congratulations on the uh, additions to the family. I I saw you. Um, I can't remember which tournament it was, but with the um, the the dad with the baby in tow in the like ergo or whatever it's called. Yeah. How's uh how's being a dad treating you so far? Yeah, I mean it 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 um, actually from the after he uh, after his birth, uh, I made the immediate in, in elo jump like from. 2650 to close to 2700. So, so it definitely gave me some energy, some positive energy. And uh, I want to show him that uh, the daddy is not that stupid. <laughs> that was- <laughs> so, so, and um, okay, till then Y and Z came, and then I was back to where I started from. Oh, after that? Yeah, I mean, that was like. I mean, lost like 20 points in Y and Z, and because of the the fatigue and everything, and uh, well, the depression. The next two weeks, you lose lose another 10 points. So basically, I went back from 26.95 to 26.65, and that's basically where I am now. So. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, chess at your level is a, a high performance activity. So having had. I, my kids are four and one and a half, and I can't imagine trying to compete with the the monsters that you have to play against, like after a baby waking me up overnight and all of that stuff. Yeah, well, I, I well, I must say that after the guy after after the guy was born, I well, we, we went to play some tournaments together, some but some open tournaments, which was actually, I could manage it quite well. Because actually, the idea. I was like the predator, you know, 
but not in Waikanze. In Waikanze, maybe I should have uh, considered my options. Get a separate room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, or, or, or whatever. Yeah. yeah, I mean, basically, it was a bit too much if you have to catch up in uh, all opening theory. I mean, don't play those guys uh, the whole year. I mean, on that level. I mean, I was playing those guys on like 26, 50 guys and, and below, which I could manage quite well. But okay, if you play 27, 50 guys, it's just no story. I, I can't even imagine. They're, they would they would crush me 2650 or 2750. It wouldn't make a difference. So um, so you also had the, the Dutch championship recently. Congratulations. Um, so is that so that's eight time Dutch champion? Is that right? The English internet is a little confusing in, in counting your championships. Yeah, it's eight times now. I mean, I, I have to get used to it as well. I mean, because when you announced me as the eight-time Dutch champion, I said, oh, yeah, eight times. That's that's correct, yeah. But uh, I think on, on Wikipedia or whatever, it's still probably seven. Or, um, and uh, But this year, actually, it was quite important for me to, to win it because, um, uh, well, I don't know what the future will, will bring me. So uh, you just want to take this one down. Yeah, for sure. And I, uh, Luke, I, I know that you're in the Netherlands, but where actually do you live? Are you in uh, Amsterdam or elsewhere? Yeah, I live in a city called uh, Tilburg. We used to have a big tournament. Uh, it was called the Interpolis Tournament in Tilburg. And actually, since I started to live there, it's uh, kind of uh, disappeared. Um, but it's a city of like... 200,000 inhabitants in a province called North Brabant. Okay. It's, a, it's in the south end. And I will move to a city called Os. It's not a big city, but uh, actually I grew up in that area and I went to school there, to high school there. I was fighting there with the local people there. So, <laughs> so, so I had built my reputation over there. Okay, and what like what made you decide to switch towns? Well, actually, I was just looking for a nice place to to live. I mean, I don't. I'm kind of flexible because for my for my chest, it doesn't really matter if I'm if I live in a, in which city I live. But uh, especially in Holland, it's very small. I mean, and so and again, you know, my parents are. 72 and 74, and so now I'm living quite close to my parents. There's also maybe a good reason, and also it felt like a bit like uh, coming home, you know, to uh, where I grew up and uh, lived for like almost 20 years. So, Make, makes sense, yeah, and I'm sure your parents appreciate getting to see uh, the grandkid. And yeah, we shouldn't live too close, but close, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um Talking about Dutch chess, uh, Luke, um, so you won the championship this year. Um, as I mentioned before we started recording, you're the first guest we've had from the, from the Netherlands. Obviously, you guys have a, a rich chess history. So could you tell our listeners just a little bit about like, generally what your life is like as a, as a chess professional there? Like, Obviously, you travel to compete a lot, but what do you do when you're home besides take care of the baby, chess-wise? Ah, uh, well... That, that's um, how to say. Uh, you should, because uh, I should say like what I'm supposed to do when I'm <laughs> home, like, like like a chess professional. And uh, well, basically, I have a very nice uh, study room, but well, um, I I never really study there to be honest. So actually, I work quite hard uh, during the tournaments. And we normally have to catch up a lot. So at home, I just follow, basically I follow uh, the um, tournaments, I follow the news, and I play some Blitz sometimes. I mean, I used to play Blitz quite a lot online back in the days. But uh, basically, uh, if I really want to work on chess, then I should be in some training session outside or, or to be at a tournament. Okay. Um, and do you do any like uh, lectures around the Netherlands? Do you, do you do any teaching or do you mostly stick to playing? 
Yeah, well, I mean, basically, I play a lot less in the leagues. So we have, okay, I play in the Dutch league, I play in the Belgian league, in the German league, French league, Spanish league, or even the Greek league. Mm -hmm. So that's really some significant uh, part of my my chess. And, uh, well, I, I give some simuls here and there, do some, have some training sessions. But, uh, yeah, and, okay, yes, if, if I feel like I, I play some tournaments, but not not that often anymore. I, I like to play only tournaments where, where, well, really, I like to go there for a particular reason, basically. If I haven't visited that place uh, before. Oh, interesting. So it's yeah. more, it's as much about like the novelty and the travel as the actual chess? Yeah, I mean, because I don't really, okay, I mean, if you play, let's say, why can say, okay, I've played in the A group like 25 times. So basically, uh, it's not about uh, visiting why can say, but I actually, I like the place, but uh, the tournament can be really, uh, Tough and unpleasant, especially if you if you start uh, if you start uh, badly. But uh, in some other terms, like uh, the championship, I was very keen uh, to win it, and it was very tense. And oh, it was it was a nice tournament. So and what else I played? I played the one in Zurich, which I like to go there with my family just to visit Zurich. And uh, well, it was a very pleasant stay there. So, so I'm looking basically for. Okay, why can I say it's not like uh, very funny to to go there with the family. The championship was like kind of interesting for me because I want to take down the title, and for the rest, I'm just looking for some exotic places uh, where tournament is not too strong. Huh. Where well, you have a, a pretty good chance of uh, of winning or placing highly. Yeah, and the way it's not, uh, you, you don't need to prepare that hard for the for the game, yeah? right? Because, because let's say your opponent is probably uh, in the night to drinking as well. So <laughs> nice, yeah. That that's <laughs> yeah. been a topic of conversation. Or do you ever uh, do you ever go out drinking like uh, nights before rounds? Um, well, I find it kind of hard to play. You know, uh, after uh, after having a hangover. Yeah. I mean, I don't know how I, I don't know how those other guys are dealing with that, but uh, well, yeah, it's not uh, so funny. But um, let's say if there's a um, rest day before, then you know, then I, li I like to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you've got a lot of friends that you see and stuff like that. Sure. Um, so how is uh, how is chess in the Netherlands doing generally right now? Obviously, Anish Giri is uh, doing quite well for himself, but um, is the general landscape of chess is it popular in terms of like compared to how popular it's been historically, or less so right now? Yeah, actually, it's quite quite popular. It has a good reputation. Um, I don't really agree with uh, your opinion about Anish Giri because. My opinion, he's not doing particularly well. Oh, really? Yeah, I mean, it was like maybe two years ago or one year ago when he played the candidates. I mean, we thought like he had a good chance to win the candidates, but then, well, he, he missed too many chances there. Okay, he drew all his games. And since then, yeah, I think it. He dropped out of the top 10, and at that time, I think he was like 2,800, and now he's like 2,770, and not winning any tournaments. So, but, I mean, it's can we really say that uh, that he's he's doing so well. I think he he's a better player than his uh, rating is. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I was thinking more like on the... You know, I mean, it's hard to to get and stay in the top ten. So you're holding him to a pretty high standard. I mean, obviously, uh, we you know we would want him to do as well as possible. But it seems to me to like make it to the top ten and then fall back a little bit and sort of consolidate. That's like normal in someone his his age is 
progression, wouldn't it be? Yeah, but I mean, uh, the point is that okay, for I think if in the top ten is basically not not enough, and you you really want him to be a, a contender. And right now, we don't see him like a possible contender. Maybe one or two years ago, he, he was like a com- playing like a contender. But uh, right now, it's more like uh, maybe a top ten player. But so I don't know. He has to to change gears. But okay, it's well, not, not not so easy. Yeah, it, I'm sure it isn't. But uh, definitely young enough where he could potentially uh, make another push. Um, and speaking of which, our, our mutual friend, Jan Gustafsson, fed me some questions to give you because I know that you guys are good friends. So uh, <laughs> one question, yeah. and, and um, you're a little bit prepared for this, but one question from Jan was, uh, please, like, uh, for you to say if you think this ranking of Dutch players historically is, is something that you agree with or not. So these are, the, according to Jan, the top four Dutch players in this order. Um, don't, Mac- tell, don't, tell, don't tell me I'm number four. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it is. Max <laughs> Oive, uh, Jan Timmen, Anish, and you at number four. So agree or disagree? Uh, I like to disagree. Okay. So what would your order be? Um, well, actually, it's actually, by the way, number one is Max Oever. Oh, uh, sorry. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay, so, anyway, sorry about that. Yeah, so, um, okay, let's say um, uh, you have to think also in a way like which players make your heart beat faster. Okay. So, so I think Timon, Timon does, um and my, my game is always very tense, but I'm not sure about uh, Anish Gil. He still has something to prove. Yeah, you this. put that in a very diplomatic manner. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, very delicate. But I, yeah. but I get what you're saying. I mean, he has that reputation, although you know, with the, about the draws, I think it's a little a little unfair. But um, it, it it is unfair. Uh, I mean, he's I mean he's uh, he's fighting, but somehow. He's not, uh, uh, I don't know, there's something he's missing. He's, he's, just, he's not simply not just the, the killer uh, that uh, he needs to be in some, 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 some. <laughs> I know that sound. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you go ahead. It's no, uh, he's, uh, he's okay, he's, I mean, he's, yeah. He's, the other thing I would say is obviously he's very young and like in sports, I know that Jan mentioned that you're an NBA fan and we'll get to that. But in sports, if you're to like rank the players all time, you would never put like a 23 year old as like one of the top five players all time, no matter how good they are, because a lot of yeah. it is about legacy. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah, that's a big misjudgment from Jan Gustafsson, I think you can uh, you can uh Tell him that. Okay. Well. Well. Hopefully, yeah, he'll hear this. So yeah, uh, we'll <laughs> pass no, it along. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, he's he's still young. He still has to prove a lot, and um, well, and he still has to gain many fans in Holland. In fact. Oh really? Yeah. I mean, uh, okay. It's because uh, people. Okay, they they like to see blood and uh, on the board. Basically, it, it right. doesn't matter if it's your <laughs> your right. opponent's blood or your blood or any blood is. So this is something, and yeah, I I I, I think Anish still has to to work on that, and he has to 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 mix up his game because uh, he is playing a bit. Too cautious in some uh, situations. That makes sense. Um, okay, so Luke, you mentioned you also like to follow the modern tournaments. We're recording this um, on Thursday, and of course, I'm not even going to Thursday, September 28th. It's actually not going to come out for about ten days. But obviously, we've had these two huge tournaments back to back. We had the World Cup, and right now, Isle of Man is going on. Although it'll be done by the time this is released. So, uh, what have been your impressions of these two tournaments? Um, 
Well, I must say, Iron Man. I, I mean, it's a nice tournament, but uh, not for me. I like. To, it's nice to follow it, but uh, yeah, I, w- I was just looking at just a, a, f- a few few games. I mean, I'm just have following a few guys because it it's just simply too much to uh, to uh, to check all the games. So, of course, Martin Carlsen is of course one of my favorites because I always always follow him um, then I'm also following uh, this guy Benjamin Bock because okay he's I'm I always like to tease him and, uh, <laughs> yeah and, uh, so, so what do you tease him about uh, well all, all kinds of stuff it's not it's uh, uh, because the, the guy let's say um, he, he never knows if I'm telling the truth or I'm bullshitting. Okay. So, I, so I, since he didn't do, do his homework well, so I, so I can tell him any story. And then he's looking at me uh, like, uh, uh, are, are you playing me or what? Eh? Right. So, and then there were a few particular games that I, I, like, I was following. So I was following uh, I was this game between Sokolov Ivan Sokolov and Lawrence Trent, those are like two coffee house players. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and then I was also, of course, following uh, uh, Trent against uh, Kramnik, of course. Yeah, so you've got some, some personal history. I, it sounds like with Lawrence, too, but I know you do with uh, with Mr. Kramnik. Yeah, no, but okay, I... I know I know Lawrence, but not to have something against him. But uh, it's just kind of uh, I can imagine how uh, uh, I can visualize him playing Kramnik, or I can visualize to be Kramnik and then have to face Lawrence, and then do he have to concede a draw, and how that would feel like, and then that you want to commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jan said it's a terrible development for chess. <laughs> well. Uh, I think, for example, uh, uh, I think it's it's fine. You have to give uh, this poor guy also sometimes. Uh, uh, you have to uh, give him some some credits. And uh, but you know, like the guy has been playing blitz with with Carlson, and Carlson was giving the guy rook also. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, he's a but he's a funny character. Yeah, he is, and we're just kidding, Lawrence. Uh- yeah. We kid because we love. Um, yeah. Okay. So, and uh, speaking of Kramnik, um, you, Jan told me, and I wasn't aware of this, that you've uh, worked with him a little bit in the past. So I think our, our listeners would love to hear what that was like. Well, it's also a hell of a job. And basically, um, well, I mean, if uh, it's like if you, you work for this uh, top guys, it's like modern slavery, you know? Right. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, you're deprived of sleep and, uh, and you eat at irregular times. And uh, what I disliked the most was that, okay, uh, you basically you work so much with the computer or the engine that um, uh, you it kills your creativity. You also think like, what is my contribution in this? Like maybe 10, 20% or whatever. So basically after working with the guys, you simply want to quit, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. Quit chess uh, or quit working with them or? With chess, with chess. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, so it's just too much, it's just too intense basically. Yes, and it's kind of brain killing work. So do, so, do you think that like you wouldn't do it anymore, or it's just something you know what you're signing up for, but you'd suck it up and do it at some point? Well, I, I like I don't mind to work for, for Top Gun, but not that intense. You know, this was really like, and Chronic is really uh, demanding a lot from his guys. Uh huh. Well, and, uh, yeah, I mean his preparation is legendary, so. Amazing. I mean, I've, I've been working with uh, Gatikamski, but it was like back in the days, like in in 96, when uh, he was playing uh, Karpov for the world title. And 
in those days, computer was not so strong. It was all about ideas and what that you really have to think uh, by yourself. And in, I think it was in 2002, I was working with Topalov. And this was a kind of interesting work because, um, I mean, me and Vesting, we were sitting over the board and not looking at the computer. And his coach manager, uh, Silvio Danalov, he was shouting the moves which is suggested by the computer. And this is, in this way, you keep on thinking by, by yourself and you still get the feed from the, from the engine. So that's actually was quite, quite a good uh, way of uh, working and to stimulate your creativity, which uh, I think Toblo actually is known for to be a creative player with having many ideas. Yeah, that does sound like a, a, a good way to combine the the engines and, you know, using what got you guys to the top, using your brains and coming up with ideas on your own. Yeah, so, but because you know that, for example, a guy like Kramnicke, back in the days, he was also uh, a very creative player. And I mean, and he learned chess, let's say, in the old fashioned way. But uh, his the computer... Uh, change uh, his work, uh, work working method a lot and I think only by now he realized that actually he's still a great player and he, I mean he doesn't need the opening that much but he, he can just play right it seems like generally there's been a little bit of a shift towards thinking that way mainly like people watching Magnus and seeing what he does yeah although Magnus is is doing it a bit too extreme in my opinion because um, he basically um, doesn't put any pressure at all as as a white. Mm-hmm. So, well, I mean, for me, for example, it's still a big difference in you know, white or black, black. So, but yeah, I think, I, and that's why I think uh, just, if you're black against Magnus, it's uh, actually it's a big advantage. I mean, because you. you you don't have to worry uh, if you play any other guy like, uh, well, whatever, in, in Aronium or any of these top guys. Then you, if you're black, you you, you really have to be afraid of some some novelty. Right. Well, speaking of which, another question fed to me by Jan. Um, he says, then it's always good to ask why he keeps losing in the Nidorf instead of going for a solid opening. So since you mentioned uh, different results with white and black, I might as well throw in that question from... Um, yeah, from- um, basically, okay, you have... It's, let's say if you play a solid opening, okay, Jan thinks that the Berlin is, would suit me uh, well. Mm-hmm. Um, for your information, I've been playing, let's say, the solid Rubenstein French for a while and uh, it didn't go that uh, well either so basically I still called me the bad <laughs> so so then I thought okay I might as well have some fun in the night of where actually also you're playing for all results let's say when you play Rubenstein French let's say well I mean the chances of winning are not that uh, not that high. So, yeah. So, and, well, the, the point is that I actually I'm also winning a lot of games with Black in the night off. But, uh, well, people always remember these, those, those bloody uh, uh, games that I got butchered uh, so badly that, uh, you know, it's still... Uh, uh, people will remember it till the end of the days. Right. So, but well, but well, it's, that, 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 that's fine, actually. Um, and Jan Gustafsson, he had this idea that I that I should make some video series for uh, for Chess Twenty Four. Uh, it's called. Uh, my Sicilian disasters. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, <laughs> and and it could be a, a sequel because I have all the material. Yeah. Um. 
again, I, um, we're just kind of jumping around. I, I had some other uh, modern chess questions, but since we're on the topic, we actually have – I like to, to let the supporters of the podcast know in advance who's coming on, and they send in questions. And um, let's see. Okay, here's the question. Uh, Ashish Mukaji asks, uh, you're, you're a world-class player and a legend of Dutch chess, but it seems uh, many of your most famous games find you on the losing side. Does, does this bother you at all? Um, well, it, it, a little bit though, because, okay, I, 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 I won also a lot of good games, but normally it's like, it's like this when, uh, I don't get made it, then normally, uh, let's say I managed to reach an end game where let's say I, 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 I dare to say that uh, I'm one of the uh, better, uh, end game players. And there I had many nice technical uh, wins. But okay, people, they, 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 they like this slugfest way as somebody's getting uh, slaughtered like, like me. Right. So, yeah, it's uh, uh, when you look at uh, the, the books, the tactical books and stuff like that, or, or the miniatures, okay. Chances that uh, I'm there as a, as the victim, uh, yeah, I'm, well, I'm, and I, I I I probably have more more chance to do well in some end game book, but yeah, we lost end games, yeah. Okay, so it bothers you, but not too much. Yeah, well, because okay, I I know what's the uh, I I I know the the overall uh, picture. So. Yeah, I mean, people like me, I would love to have some game where I get brutalized in a chess book because at least I would be in the book. <laughs> that's, that's the only way I'm going to make it. So, <laughs> um, so what you mentioned that your strength is playing end games, or at least it's one of your strengths. So what did you do to cultivate that strength or did it just come naturally to you? Well, actually it's, um, it's, uh, the two aspects which are actually kind of important. Actually, well, I love end games, so I was uh, I was always very keen of analyzing them. So okay, you basically train your feel you feel uh, you feel for end games. So that's uh, one thing. And I mean, basically, I've been testing some 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 twenty seven hundred plus GMs with some end games, and it's really amazing. Uh, you know that those guys they are, they are simply swimming. They have no clue what's going on, and well, it's it's a big uh, a leak in their chess uh, culture. Yeah, Ju- uh, Judith Pogar just said the same thing. I interviewed her last week, and she said almost the exact same statement. Yeah, and you didn't believe her, but I hope you now you believe me. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think I need one more person to say it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So, so that's that's. I mean, that's one very important aspect. That uh, well, basically, okay. You also need to be. You have this. You need to have this patience. You know. You know that you can sit there for hours and hours and hours trying to squeeze some little advantage out of your opponent. And the last but not least, I mean, you have to be ready to. Uh, and uh, physically ready to play this six, seven hour game. And you can basically let your opponent off the hook by some loss of concentration in, in the seventh hour. Basically, you have to keep on pounding the guy for seven hours and just to... Because uh, normally if you put pressure on your opponent for, for seven hours, at some point the guy will break. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you have, like, how do you prepare for that? Do you have, like, a fitness regimen, or what do you do in order to, keep, like, stay strong in the seventh hour? Well, I mean, basically, I, I love sports. Uh, I, I wish I had more time to to, uh, to do some sports, but uh, still, I do a lot of sports. And, uh, well, I mean, for sure, I'm uh, 44, and I'm still... Uh, if I look at some teenagers uh, in Holland, let's say, or I'm sure I'm more fit than them. Yeah, and it's so, especially impressive with a you know one and a half year old or however old your son is. Like 
that's that's no small feat. It's hard when it's hard when you're taking care of the kid to get out and exercise too. Yeah, although the guys, uh, when you have to hold him for uh, uh, and play with him, it also makes you stronger. So it's also, but it, that's more like bodybuilding. So I'm not uh, <laughs> right. So, so what sort of sports do you play? Um, well, actually, I um, I have a challenge coming up. My uh, my uh, my father-in-law is coming to Holland next spring, and we're going to run the marathon of Rotterdam. So that's uh, wow. something. And yeah, and I, I I want to finish at least one hour ahead of him. <laughs> that's a, that's a good goal. Yeah. How how old is he? Uh, he is like. Um, well, he should be like sixty or something. I, I'm not. I don't know exactly okay. how old he is. So, yeah, but he's he's a he's a passionate marathon runner, and uh, yeah, we, we ran the marathon in in I think it was 2010 or 11, and. Uh, He's getting his revenge, but it's, it's, it's not going to be any better. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, that you don't get to 2700 without a competitive spirit. So uh, my, my money's on you in this. Yeah, I, 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 it's not about it. I just want to destroy him. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, okay, so it, speaking of, you already mentioned some of the players you've worked with in the past. And the other thing about you that, that is amazing is you've played, I feel like you've probably played everyone, like, you know, if you take the top 25 players in the world, I'd be surprised if there's there's anyone you haven't um, played at some point. So out of all the people you've played and worked with, was there someone that impressed you more than others? Uh, well, definitely it was Kasparov, who was always like, uh, very impressive at that time. He's, he's, I think I had this feeling that this guy was simply ahead of his time. So, and, uh, and he had such a high energy level at such a high level of preparation and uh, I think he was simply very also very professional in his uh, in what he was doing so I mean I, as a politician uh, let's not talk about it but uh, as a chess player I was really uh, this guy was really uh, on top of the game and did you get a chance to analyze with him yeah, actually, I played with him a few times, and uh, also we had uh, after the game we had uh, we analyzed a bit. Yeah, sure, and uh, yeah, and the, the, this guy was uh, something special. Like, I, okay, of course, Carlson is also uh, in some way special, but uh, yeah, I mean, Kaspar was different in my opinion. Yeah, it seems like he was maybe farther ahead of his peers for longer. Although, you know, the, yeah. fi the final story hasn't been told on Magnus, but at least looking at it right now. Yeah, because, okay, Magnus really was starting to dominate like uh, Kasparov did uh, like a few years ago, but then he basically dropped back. And um, now, but now, okay, now he's getting his mojo back. So I uh, want to see uh, what's going to happen now in the the next few years, because I think Magnus had a, say like two bad years, I think. Yeah. Um, and what do you think of uh, Kasparov's comeback? Uh, well, I don't really consider it as a comeback. It, it was just uh, nice that he played some blitz and rapid games with the guys, and uh, and okay, it was announced as his comeback, but uh, I don't think we should see it like that. I mean, it's uh, it's clear that the guy can still play chess. At the, quite a decent level and uh, but we should not uh, exaggerate about uh, his, his comeback it's, it's nice that he, that he showed that he's still there and he can still play chess and well but it's not uh, like the old uh, Kasparov as we know okay and is that what you expected going in yeah I mean uh, I think maybe next year he will do this Again, the same in St. Louis, like his yearly. Uh, right. Any inside his, information on that, or just uh, just speculation? 
Just speculation, yes. Yeah. So, so you, you're not the first one who can announce it. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, it's a. Uh, I don't know. I feel like generally people um, maybe overestimated like how important it is to be in form, even for a legend like him. Yeah, I mean, of course, the guy was always uh, connected with chess, and I think he was always following it. But the, um, yeah, it, it, and of course, the guy had such a high level that that's why you're still able to compete on, I say, twenty-seven fifty level. But um, yeah, um, I don't think the guy has the ambition to return to chess, and, and it, it, it is nice that he can still play with the top guys and still be not a, a punching bag, huh? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's amazing, really. Um, okay, so, so Luke, uh, one other topic that we have to talk about, much to my embarrassment as an American citizen, is is uh, your experience with, uh, with U.S. Customs when you came here. So it's a bit of a legendary story, but do you mind telling it for our listeners who haven't, uh, haven't heard uh, the misfortune that befell you? Yeah, uh, I don't mind, actually. So it was in 2012, and um, uh, I was going to to the U.S. for a long road, road trip and for like two months. And I arrived in, in, in Newark, in New Jersey. And, um, well, basically... Um, well, it didn't really cross my mind when when the guy was uh, asking me what uh, at the border what I was going to do in the U.S. I said, okay, I'm going to play some chess, play some poker, some holidays, and a few days um, I was going to teach chess to some kids. So, and basically uh, what I didn't realize is that uh, teaching chess is uh, they call, it's considered as work, and basically it's uh, forbidden on this uh, on this visa waiver program. So basically, once they um, yeah they, they consider you as an illegal uh, you coming on illegal illegal grounds to the U.S. and you will be deported to the U.S. and since then. Well, I'm not. Uh, I'm blacklisted. Wow. So, I mean, <laughs> I sort of get them turning you away if you didn't have the proper paperwork or what they consider the proper paperwork. But blacklisting you seems quite extreme to me. Yeah. No. Well, basically, well, I mean, you're like for the rest of your life, you have to apply for a visa, and uh, I. I applied uh, for uh, visa right after uh, I came back to Holland after I got deported, and uh, well, basically, I went to the uh, American consulate in Amsterdam, but and the guy um, guy there, he he looked like well, he thought probably that he was like the last line of defense of the U.S. And he asked me some questions. I had a bad feeling, and within five minutes, I was standing outside with a letter of refusal on, on no particular ground. Wow. So, well, and since then, I didn't have really the appetite to to try again to uh, to visit the U.S. And um, well, it seems also a bit hectic these days in the U.S. So. <laughs> to put it lightly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, I mean, so there's not rioting on the streets or anything, but yeah, it's not a. Uh, of all the times to try to go through customs here, it's probably not the best. So, yeah, um, yeah, that's a that's a bummer of a story though, because you you were pretty active for a while in the the U.S. tournament circuit with some yeah, successes. Also, yes, yes. Uh, well, I mean, also it has to do with my wife is from El Salvador, right? And and back in the days, that okay, actually. Uh, when she still lived in El Salvador, we we met the, in the U.S. and then we, uh, we had some holidays and played some chess together, so that kind of made sense. And okay, but to be honest, uh, U.S. chess wise is not that interesting. Um, I mean, this millionaire chess was kind of 
nice to play. I would have wouldn't have mind to play there, but but uh, well, can't really say that it's uh, so exciting. Let's say I remember the last time I played one of these uh, Goldsberg tournaments, and okay, if you win a prize, they also they they tax you like thirty percent. It's not so funny either. Yeah. You pay all your expenses and uh, and they even be taxed thirty percent and then it's kind of a really big uh, problem to get this money back if you if you can get it back at all. Yeah. Because I'm going to, I'm going to be taxed as well in, in Holland. So this, right. uh, yeah. So I'm all... sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so basically there's no real incentive to, to play chess in the US, but but I made some really nice uh, trips there. And okay, I miss I miss Las Vegas, and uh, well, I always want to go to visit uh, to see an NBA match. Right. Well, I'm sure they'll do it. Like, didn't they do a game in London at some point? Yeah, yeah, but that's but okay, but uh, that's not the, the real thing. Huh? Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, so a couple things from that. Num- number one, poker. Um, so. You you played professionally for a bit and were sponsored for, by poker stars for a bit, right? No, that's not. No, I I, I both are not right. Both I inaccurate. Mean, okay. Yeah, I at mean, least I, I'm, I, at least I'm consistent. Yeah, I I was never a professional player, and uh, and I know I was never sponsored by anybody. Okay. So, and I have to be. Uh, I'm kind of um, passionate. Recreative player, but I'm still, to be honest, I'm still in minus. So, so I'm not, uh, when you're a professional player and you're minus, that also doesn't sound good. Right. Although you wouldn't be the first person to call yourself a professional despite not winning money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. But okay, let's say professional is, is at least somebody who is uh, devoting his time eh, or uh, playing poker. And uh, especially in my situation right now with. Uh, Little guy, I can play maybe one day a week poker. So I want to increase to two days and maybe some to to study a bit more. But uh, right now, it's uh, I simply not I don't have enough time yet. Yeah, and do you play online when you play? Uh, yeah, I mean I used to play online, but uh, since his birth, I didn't play. Okay. Yeah, I mean, my understanding from I, you know, I used to play for a living, and my friends, I have friends who still do, and I don't think you're missing that much right now. Yeah, but okay, I mean, but okay, I he, now I'm, I'm moving to another place so where we have a dishwasher, so I'll really save some time over there. Okay, <laughs> nice. All right, and of course, I want to talk about the NBA too because I'm I'm a big fan. You're a big fan. Uh, so, what uh, do you have a favorite team? Uh, not, not really, but, uh, um, but okay, I, okay, I'm, but of course I'm, I'm a fan of, uh, LeBron James. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Some people like young Gus on the, he hates them. He hates him for, for whatever reason. Yeah. Right. But, yeah, uh, but I think he's a great player and great sport, uh, sportsman. And, uh, but, um, yeah, I'm. I'm just uh, very curious how a few teams will do uh, next uh, next season. So, which ones? Uh, I'm looking to see how uh, if finally uh, uh, Philadelphia will do well. Oh, my hometown. Yeah, that, oh, yeah? that should that should be interesting. So, just a team to watch. Then, okay, yeah, I'm curious how Minnesota will do. Yeah. Curious how Boston will do. Yeah, a lot of changes in this off season. Yeah, Houston should be interesting. Houston and okay, and let's see how it is and how Oklahoma will do now. Huh? Yeah, they just keep adding uh, big name players. Um, so do you do you watch the games when you get a chance? Yeah, but um, I I prefer just to read to watch it when it's uh, the playoffs. You know. Yeah. Uh, Normally, because of the, the time difference, I normally watch all the recaps and uh, I don't stay 
stay up uh, all night to watch some games unless uh, it's uh, okay sometimes I and I go to my family law in, in El Salvador then I can watch some games uh, uh, live yeah yeah even for me it's it's sort of the same thing just because uh, basketball is a game where if you watch it I feel like you have to be paying full attention and I, I can't set aside like three hours or two and a half hours or whatever it is that often. So I, I like you, I follow the news and read the recaps, but and watch the highlights. But I don't actually watch games that often. Um, yeah, but okay. I don't know when I will be able to visit uh, to see a match uh, really uh, live. But maybe I have to go to uh, Toronto or whatever. Right, <laughs> it's so unfo- <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It's so unfortunate yeah. that that you your persona non grata here. Yeah. Um, okay, so Jan also gave me another hot button topic to ask you about. He asked me or planted the seed that I should ask you about the the famous chess trainer Chuchulov, who has worked with Geary and Fabiano, and said that you had some unique experiences with him. Yeah. Well. Um... I mean, I, I worked with the for, uh, with the guy for for seven years, and um, well, I mean, uh, we did a d- decent uh, work. I was, I mean, we did a, a good job. We found some novelties, and uh, it was kind of good work on 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 openings, mainly on openings. But um, yeah, then he later became. Uh, coach of Giri, Caruana, and the national team, and and he got a little bit. I don't know what the, what happened in his head, but um, you know he, he thought he became the best trainer of the world. Certainly, uh-huh. and um, well, maybe with these young guys, he can, he can sell them any any kind of stories, but not like his old. Foxes like me or <laughs> Ivan Sokolov. Eh? I mean, we've we've seen it all, eh? Right. And then uh, when this guy starts to uh, suddenly starts to uh, speak like he's uh, he un- understands everything, and we don't understand anything. Eh? So it then it's time to fire back at him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So and uh, well, okay, we had uh, some. Some also some conflicts in the end because he was like the, the coach of the national team. When I, so at some point I I told him like, um, okay, this is the last time you're going to be the coach of the national team. And later he got fired, and then you thought, well, maybe uh, it was kind of logical that he thought like that that he got fired because of me. But anyway, <laughs> it was like already a team decision. Uh-huh. And he, he blamed me for that, basically. And uh, since then, we we are on non-speaking terms. Which is kind of, uh, well, kind of uh, sad. But, but, okay, we worked for many years so very well together. But, um, well, it is what it is. And I, but I was a bit angry because... Uh, because because of our our work, he, he he made his big name. So, and in my opinion, he should be a bit grateful instead of uh, blaming me for for that. So I think it was kind of uh, it was kind of out of line. Right. And, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah. But but what is your chest level? Me. Yeah. I'm about twenty one eighty feet. Eh? I'm a okay. I'm a fish. Because uh, okay, let me give you then. Because one time I, I, you know, the guy was. Uh, I, I tell you some funny story. One time, the guy uh, he was giving us some stupid exercises, eh? and said, "Okay, listen, now I'll put you in exercise, and let's see how you do here. Very simple exercise. Uh, it's like why has king on g three." Pawn on h4. That's white. Okay. Black has king on f1. Rook on e2. That's black. Uh huh. And white to move. So I asked the guy, like, oh, okay, what do you play here for white? For and white? What does your, 
yeah, why to move? What's your what? And my first question is, what which, uh, what does your intuition say? And second question will be, what is the actually the correct move? Okay, I mean, I, I'm sure I'll embarrass myself, but I would think King G4. So, yeah, G4 is uh, what well, King G4? You mean? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, King G4 is uh, is 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 a good move. What about King F4? Um. What's the idea? It's the same like King G4 or King F4. Okay. Um, and yeah, it seems the same. Seems the same, yeah? Yeah. And what, and what about H5? Uh, let's see. The the kings on, black kings on F1, and where's the black rook? E2? Yeah. Uh, so then he can cut off the king, right? Yeah. So n- so not... So, so, the, so the, the, the self-proclaimed world best trainer, uh, Dolby, uh, H5, but it has to be calculated. Then I look at the guy, like, if he's kidding me, yeah, but he was that serious. Huh. So, I, I think he missed a few lessons in the playing his palace. So, and actually, there's a difference between King F4 and King G4. One of them is uh, winning, uh, drawing, and one is losing. It's oh, actually, really? Yeah. What, are you able to explain it in a way that, like, we could understand without a board? Or? Yeah, I mean, basically, the, the um, uh, one of the teams in this rook end game is like uh, a king against uh, rook against uh, pawn. End game is that with white, you like to shoulder. Uh, you like to block black king. So normally you like to take the central position with the king. So so most natural move would be king f4. Or let's say you you block the most space for black king to to pass Come by. In. Okay, so king f4 wins and king g4 draws. No, or I loses. Mean, sorry, uh, draws yeah. and loses. Yeah, but in fact it's all the way around. I mean, king g4 draws. And King F, King F4 loses because actually, uh, if you play King F4, you allow Black to play King G2 and to pass make uh, you go and it goes to for H3 H4. Ah, okay, okay. So I accidentally got it right. I know that's what you, <laughs> you don't don't uh, you should not uh, downplay yourself. Huh? Oh, thanks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, um, so what's your next tournament, Luke? What's going on, like chess wise, with you right now? Um, well, not much, in fact. Um, actually, um, this year I'm okay. I'm running a tournament myself in Hoogerveen, uh, where we have two matches: Ivanchuk against Yi and um, Altiban against uh, Jordan van Verreest. Then I'm going to the European Team Championship as a team captain. Nice. That's Which, always a fun tournament, at least for the spectators. Yeah. Or fans, I should say, not, the, not yeah. necessarily the people there. Oh. Sure. And uh, in December, I have a training session with two juniors, uh, with uh, Benjamin Bock and uh, Jordan van Verreest. Okay. Yeah, you guys can... You, you've got some up-and-comers in uh, in the Netherlands. No, but I'm training them just to keep them down. Them <laughs> right. <laughs> That's funny. You don't want the top four list to change. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just uh, okay. it's just a pity that we have this guy Annie Gear there. Otherwise, I would be sitting on my throne. Right. <laughs> forever. I mean, in a haunt. That's funny. Um, and what's it like, like making a living as a chess professional in Holland? Is it is it difficult, or do you have enough opportunities? Yeah, I am. I I don't really uh, complain. I mean, basically, right now my life consists of uh, working two weeks, uh, two days in the week, and the rest I can uh, be a house uh, house uh, dad. That doesn't sound too bad. So when you work, what do you what do you mean by that? Like, what do you have to do for the work? Well, it's uh, just play a game or uh, the I, league games. Okay, the league games or. I give a simul or I prepare some training. So, yeah, and then uh, if I have some money left, I lose it at poker. 
So do I mean I I can't resist getting into poker a little bit. So what's holding you back? Like what what do you need to improve? What game do you play? I just play No Limit Hold'em, but uh, but what's basically holding me back that I'm not really dedicated. Okay. So basically, not really studying or you know li- uh, living for it. You know, like yeah. Uh, and do you and play cash games or tournaments or both? I play uh, tournaments, but I should play more cash games because I'm much more of a cash game player. But since I'm pretty stupid, uh, I keep on playing tournaments, which I uh, have uh, this huge uh, variance. Right. So, so yeah, not uh, that's not that clever. If I want to have a steady income, I should just play this uh, cash yeah. game. Yeah. Yeah, it depends on your goals. I mean, I I haven't been playing actively for like six years or something, but I mean. I do feel like you probably get more more fish in tournaments, but yeah, if you're not if you're not getting to the long run, if you're not putting in a high volume, it's just totally random what happens. Um, you need to like, I mean, if you played two days a week and you played eight hours of tournaments a day, I would think that if you have an edge, it would manifest itself eventually. But yeah, if you're just like popping in every once in a while, you might get lucky, but there's no way of knowing if you have an edge really. Yeah, but okay. I mean, basically, uh, I also feel like that uh, in some certain uh, fields, I'm like the underdog, you know. Somehow, that that uh, my lack of practice and lack of studying, it's uh, it's uh, yeah. I I start to feel it. Yeah. Well, we got to keep you you chess monsters out of poker anyway. You you inspire too many people in chess, so. <laughs> yeah, uh, like uh, I, I have a lot of followers who also like love to get mated or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's all relative. I mean, you don't get mated as much as most people, so probably I, I'm the one who lost the most uh, games in the database. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't know about that, but uh, yeah, I mean, you've you've played a lot, so that helps. Yeah. Um, okay, let me think of. Uh, I think I've only got a couple more topics for you, Luke. But let me. Uh, let me think of what they are. Well, we have we have another listener question, which is um somewhat related to the one earlier, but uh, this is from uh, Rob Lazorchek, uh, who's also a, a chess teacher, and he says, um, I often talk to my own students about losing with dignity, and I thought your support of Asserman's book after the 2011 loss, this was a, a Smith-Mora game, uh, now that time has passed, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that opening and that game in particular. Um, well... Let's talk about this game in, uh, with, with Mark first. First of all, you know, I thought, okay, um, I thought it was just going to be some kind of coffee house game in, uh, like in a park, you know? Right. And um, it was okay. Uh, I, uh, was I, one of his friends, okay, I was, I, I, when I was still allowed to the US, I was, once I was in Boston, and okay, I think Mark he used to live in Boston, and uh, there was some other guy, friend, his, his name was Jorge Zamora. He right. was also playing this Mora Gambit, and okay, I mean, it was, it was just like a opening for Blitz, yeah? Right. So, so of course, when he offered me the pawn, of course, I took it immediately. So, for, and then later, I saw one line, um, I'm not sure if, if, he saw the line, but if I would play the safe move, then I saw that he could kind of um, sacrifice the piece. Uh, well, uh, he could sac- sacrifice the piece and win the piece back, and we, we reach some kind of equal end game. And uh, because of the equal end game, I kind of disregarded that. And then, okay, I, that, then I ran into some his preparation, which is kind of nice, of course. Later, after the game, then I start to, well, take it much more uh, serious, what he did, and try to really to find something which was not, not that simple at all. Mm-hmm. So it had some sting, what he was, uh, this uh, more again. But, well, I didn't really want to devote all my time to this more again, because after this game with Mark, I didn't face it again. But uh, just because of, um, you know, 
in the tournament after the game, of course, you know, I, I wanted to, I spent a few hours uh, on studying the Mora Gambit because, okay, I was kind of curious, but after that, I said, okay, that's, uh, that's, uh, forget about it. it it's, uh, the damage has been done and it's time to move on. Okay. Yeah, it was a, it was an interesting game. And I, 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 in preparing for this, I came across his notes on the game and he definitely had a lot of home cooking that he was finally able to, uh, to unveil on you for that game, so yeah, and I, I'm, and I must say, I was I was happy to write a preface for in the, his book, you know, because he he deserved it, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you put the work in, for sure. Um, so, what's your approach generally, Luke, to to learning openings, like in terms of your training and uh, prepping for people? Like, uh, how much time are you putting in? Like, if you see see you're, see you're playing someone the day before or something. Yeah, not not too much, but um, okay. I, in general, I believe that the people like uh, love to prepare well, but they're not really prepared, let's say, for the middle game or the end game. So I mean, it's like how can you prepare for the game, but only one as- aspect of the game? So this is what I, I don't really understand. So. Knowing the way I'm preparing for the game is that I simply want to have to reach some kind of opening or position, type of position that I'm comfortable with or my opponent is not comfortable with. It's, it's more like a, a game plan. It's not like a move by move or, or, or whatever. Sometimes you can check some line quickly with a computer, but not too deeply because you, you want to know, of course, what you're doing if it's not really, really losing a on the spot, but uh, yeah, in general, it's more like more, more like uh, try to surprise your opponent by getting him in some line that he didn't prepare than 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 really something uh, concrete. Okay, and so you just play through their games and get a feel for their style and look at a couple lines, basically. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it's, it depends on what kind of game you want to have against the guy if you want to have some kind of quiet game or some kind of double edge game that you try to choose the opening accordingly and then in the end in this open, opening you yeah it's more like um, it's not really that uh, you're going to to check the lines very uh, deeply till move 20 or or deeper Okay. It, really, it really makes no no sense. Okay, I mean, it really depends on which um, who is playing who. Okay, let's say if whatever Aronian is playing for Shayla Graf. Okay, they have uh, some maybe some Grunfeld uh, discussion. Yeah, right. This this can go very deep. But um, let's say if I play uh, myself, if I play Aronian, basically I like to to avoid the theory. Because I I know that I'm an underdog there. Right. However, okay, when let's say when I play a rodeo, I also understand that let's say chess wise I'm an underdog. So I have to choose between if I play more theory, then I don't have to play chess. So it means that uh, that's also I mean if you if you if you if you feel like that you're an underdog, you should actually play more theory because. Theory is not playing chess. It's just about uh, memorizing. Yeah, it's if, just it's just about the computer computer work. Right. Yeah. Depending on what the player's strengths are, and of course, you you have to know the theory in order to play it. But yeah. Yeah, because if you play some total potter and you know that he knows his openings very well, you try to get him out of the book as 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 early as possible. Right. So it's it's just. Um, just based on uh, what your opponent's strengths are. Okay. Um, and do you have any uh, favorite chess books? Our, our listeners are always eager to hear about any chess book recommendations. Do you have any that were particularly formative for you? Um, well, I, I have over a thousand chess books. That's a fair so, amount. <laughs> yeah. And since it, well, I know, because I'm, in the process of moving, so, right. so, I, so my back hurts a lot <laughs> right now. Right. Um, 
not really, but uh, for example, now I'm just checking this. I got books. He has a series of five books. Which yeah. Kind of, uh, they're kind of nice. I think he puts also some good work in it. So, yeah, I mean, I like I like also the the Endgame books of uh, Doctor Nun. Right. So I think he's, all, he's also uh, he's also makes no mistakes and he he does his job very well. And okay, I also like some. Uh, Kovarevsky books or some Jan Timo books. Jan Timo books maybe some more mistakes, but it's, it's not only about uh, about uh, mistakes, and also it's about ideas and even ideas maybe not always correct. But uh, yeah, uh, it doesn't really matter if there's some uh, mistake. It's just about also how uh, um, yeah if if he explaining himself well right okay cool yeah well uh jacob abgard excuse me jacob abgard gets recommended by almost every guest but john nunn for for all of his uh uh you know for the incredible reputation he has both as a player and an author he hasn't hasn't been mentioned before um so do you have any stories i mean over here in the u.s we we follow european chess closely but uh i mean y- I feel like when players are active there, they travel so often, and it's a it's a small circle of uh, of players that I'm sure you guys get to know each other really well. So, do you have any uh, sto- crazy stories from tr- from chess travels that you're, you'd be willing to share? Um. Well, I I can just tell you one story of the last European Team Championship. Okay. Yeah, which was uh, uh, we. Okay, we, I was playing for the Nas- Dutch national team together with uh, Ivan uh, Sokolov and um, Anish Giri, Aaron Lamy, and uh, Sergei Tivyakov. And um, I think we had to catch a bus at 5 o'clock in the morning. So it was a bit early, and I told my buddy Ivan Sokolov, I told okay, don't worry. I will, I will call you at uh, four o'clock or four thirty, whatever. And then, because uh, he likes to have a few drinks in the in, in the in the in the night, and you might not be able to wake up. Right. So. So. Um, so I went to bed around three o'clock, and then I woke up like eight o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Oops! Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and then, I, okay, uh, I, I realized uh, that that something went wrong. And then uh, I I sent I thought that this guy so uh, this uh, why he didn't wake me up, yeah, right, yeah, of course, so, yeah, yeah. And uh, so I sent him a message like, Ivan, where are you?" Eh? And uh, and Ivan uh, was also wondering where I was. We both overslept, uh-huh. which was uh, uh, well. Were you one. guys out together the night before, or just randomly both stayed up late? No, just in the hotel bar, I think. Okay. So, yeah, and our team just basically left left us be, uh, behind. You know, like okay, I mean this. Uh, our names were called, let's say, 20 times at the airport. Nobody even took the phone and uh, asked, okay, where are our beloved teammates? No, right. they simply, simply, simply left it even. And maybe, uh, who knows, Ivan uh, got beaten in some bar fight and ended up in the hospital or <laughs> whatever. Or whatever, eh? right. whatever could happen. But yeah, no, uh, just that uh, when, the, when uh, they arrived at... Uh, Amsterdam Airport, and it gives me a message like, oh, "Not that we are worried about you, but where are you?" <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> a little, a little too late to send that message. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, well, okay. I hope it's not going to happen again. So, but, did you guys um, make it uh, to the match? I mean, it, it was uh, it, it was at the end of the, the tournament. So okay. All right. I guess they didn't need us anymore. Right. <laughs> That's funny, though. 
if he won Sokolov was uh, felt a little bit embarrassed to c- complain about it because he had like zero out of three in the, in the European team. Uh-huh. Uh, but uh, I, di- I didn't hold back, you know. Right. Because, uh, and it seems he just had a similar uh, episode with uh, Jabava in the World Cup, I believe. Because he, he was the announcer, and I think one of the days he showed up on set with uh, some sort of bruise on his face and, yeah, 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 and yeah, yeah, a vague yeah. story. Yeah, <laughs> yes. It was very clear what happened that night, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Sounds he like... Claimed, a- he claimed that he just fell, but uh, I'm not so sure I, will, I believe him. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, it sounds like I'll have to get him on the podcast sometime. Yeah. No, also one time, I think uh, we, we went out in... Uh, in Reykjavik, and I think he was drinking the whiskey at the same pace that I was drinking Coke. Right. <laughs> so, so, and, you know, it, it can be quite slippery there in Reykjavik. Yes. So at some point he fell, of course. Uh, if, I, I, if, if I hadn't do any, done anything, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the guy would have stayed there the, the, <laughs> the whole night on, 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 on the ground, you know, because the guy couldn't get up by himself. <laughs> Wouldn't be the first grandmaster <laughs> to uh, yeah, yes. to pass out Frost that way. To, most to death, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> nice. Okay, so one more topic for you, Luke, and then I'll let you go. Um, you you made some allusions in the past to sort of like uh, in interviews about how like you you were pushing really hard in your chest and it had it had a negative impact on your relationships. Do you have any words of wisdom for our younger listeners? Maybe. Uh, you know, young up and coming chess players about how to manage one's personal life and balance that with like trying to be an elite chess player. Um, yeah, that's a hard one because uh, let's say first of all, if if you want to become uh, a really strong player, you have to be dedicated. Basically, uh, there's basically fairly little space for compromises. Yeah. Right. So basically. If you you have uh, uh, if you if you if you're on, on the right track and you want to have uh, and you're also in, in involved in uh, some sort of relationship, you need to have somebody who also understands that it, it requires sacrifices. Things don't go come naturally, and who can be supportive and and who can support you when you. Let's say you need the support, and also um, uh, shouldn't be there when, when you don't need anybody there. Something, it, and that's really the hard part, no? Right. And uh, well, it's it's not easy because if you're all by yourself, it's uh, it's simple. But uh, I mean, you're you're all responsible for everything, and you can only blame yourself, but. When people are around you, it becomes much more uh, yeah, complex. Yeah, and I'm yeah. sure that the frequent travel is also an added yeah, challenge. And, and let's say, for example, when you're dedicated, it's dedication also is sometimes mixed up with, let's say, being uh, asocial. Right. Yeah, because uh, let's say, uh, well, I mean, or... Uh, being egoistic or, or whatever, yeah. But it's, just, I mean, you all you have to ask yourself, what what do I want? Do I, I do want to reach for the maximum? And and then okay, you, you need to have uh, your if, your full support from your surroundings and yeah, it's this is the the. The main problem that people think it's it comes too easy, you know. Mm-hmm. That what comes so, too easy? That, let's say let's say success. Let's say uh-huh. for example, they don't they don't see for example the success. Uh, what what is it based on? Uh, how much work he had put in, especially when somebody uh, let's say for example. Let, let me give you an example for, let's say, Magnus Carlsen, who recently got a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And um, so she's, let's say, joining the right. But she doesn't know, let's say, uh, how much work he put in before. Right. So, no, so, so, so and, and let's say he can maybe keep his level, let's say, for 
next five years without without doing much. Yeah, but if he wants to be good, uh, let, let's say at age of forty or afterwards, let's say he has to keep on working still right now. Right. And uh, so it's kind of funny to to be in this kind of uh, whatever lifestyle which he has now. Where he, but to to also to to ma- maintain it, it's not easy. Right, and continued sacrifice is required. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, in terms of uh, your your chess development now, would you do you feel like you still have your foot on the gas, or uh, are you, um, you know, basically just trying to maintain your level and and you know raise your kids and enjoy your life at this point? Yeah, I, I like to. I think I can reasonably keep my level uh, of chess, and I don't have any really ambition of improving. But uh, uh, yeah. I think I can keep my level with two fingers in my nose. <laughs> <laughs> but okay, I invested a lot of time in my chest uh, before, so I kind of uh, taking fruits from that. Right. Well, I mean, it is, it's quite a level. Um, I, all of our listeners, I'm sure, would, would love to have the stories you have and, you know, the, the playing ability yeah. that you have. So, so thanks, Luke, for, for joining us. Um, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, my pleasure. I think my, my little guy is kind of impatient. Yeah, yeah, you better get to him. So just yeah. very, very quickly, if uh, people want to contact you, is should I just put out your Twitter or Facebook? or? Um... Yeah, uh, Facebook is fine. Yeah. That's, okay. That's, yeah. All right, will do. Well, thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Say hi to the little guy for me. Yeah, I will. Thank you very much. Yeah. Good news, everyone. We're only a few donations away from covering the cost of the podcast. Special thanks go out to my Patreon perpetual partners. They are Chris Wainscott, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Chris Flanagan, Gary Andrews, I am Greg Shahadi, Jennifer Valens, WGM Jen Shahadi, Jens Green, Kelly Palmer, Krishna Galapakrishnan, Matthew Tedesco, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Paul Sweeney, Ricky Grahava, Rob Lazorchak, Tim Seymour, Todd Bryant, and FM Zhao Chang. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll be back next week.